Hey, hi, I have a big old announcement. All the details are gonna be at the end of the video, but here's a teaser. I'm making a class, a Physics 101 course. It's gonna be freely available right here on the Physics Girl YouTube channel. So check out the end of the video for all of the details. Okay, back to your regularly scheduled YouTube video. In 1977, an Alaska Airlines flight originating in Homer, Alaska was delayed due to maintenance issues. Its air circulation system was turned off, but the passengers were still on board the airplane and sat on the runway for three hours. Within the next 48 hours, 38 out of the 53 passengers and crew started experiencing chills, fever, severe coughing, and headaches. The cause of this sickness was initially suspected to be a toxic substance introduced into the passenger compartment by engine failure. But then, after dozens of the sick passengers were hospitalized, one passenger was confirmed sick with influenza. An epidemiologist later discovered that every one of those 38 passengers they tested came back positive for the flu. That means, without air circulation systems, a whopping 72% of the people on board were infected with the viral illness from one sick passenger. But recent studies have shown that the daily reality of airplane travel is much safer than the Alaska Airlines event. How safe? Well, on an airplane with normal and functional circulation, the number of passengers likely to get sick when one fellow passenger has the flu is just 0.7 passengers. That is less than one person. So what has changed since that 1977 flight? Hey, I'm Diana, you're watching Physics Girl. And this case was so intriguing to me, it sent me down the rabbit hole of this typically overlooked but incredibly important area of research in science, air specifically ventilation and how airflow can impact your respiratory safety. So I called up a researcher at Lund University in Sweden to talk about air. We as humans, we still emit like about a million skin and hair fragment particles per hour. Wow. And if you're 10 people in a surgery room, that will <laughs> make up a concentration pretty fast. Malin has to think about those hair and skin particles and also bacteria and viruses in the air because she studies different types of airflow and ventilation systems and how they might impact, say, the spread of respiratory diseases. So let's start there. Let's talk about how you even catch respiratory diseases. Diseases like the flu, pneumonia, COVID-19. The literature on this refers to three modes of transmission. Number one is self-inoculation, which is when you basically transfer the disease to yourself by, say, touching a dirty door handle, getting the virus on your hands, and then touching your nose or mouth. That's why you're not supposed to touch your face. And then number two, large droplet transmission, which involves being coughed or sneezed on or sung to by an infected person and getting hit by droplets at least five microns in size. That size is important and it's actually come up in the news lately. We'll get to that. And then there's number three, airborne transmission. So the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus responsible for the current COVID-19 respiratory disease pandemic, can be transmitted via the first two modes. What about airborne transmission, you ask? Well, Scientists are still today debating whether SARS-CoV-2 is considered to be airborne. But being airborne may not mean what you think it means. We know you can get the disease from the air. So when public officials refer to a virus as being airborne, they generally mean that it can linger in the air in tiny droplets at that size of five microns or less. So the virus can linger in these tiny particles in the air even after the person who coughed has left the building. That might explain this news article that recently came out about a woman who rode an elevator alone in her building and went on to be the origin of 71 infected persons. And also a caveat to all of the information about COVID-19. The coronavirus that causes it was only discovered on January 7th of this year. It was only named on February 11th, 2020. So all this information is still incredibly new and scientists are rushing to understand and contain the virus. So some of this information can and probably will change. Now that we understand a bit about how respiratory diseases spread, we can talk about the magic that is ventilation research. Because for example, if you study the ventilation in hospitals, you might be able to help prevent patients from getting sick, but also protect healthcare workers. We go out to hospitals and collect air samples. And we've done that in in now three different projects. And every time we go there and we're collecting and the nurses ask, when do we get the answers? Can you say something? Can, we, can you help us? 
because uh, they don't want to have infectious diseases. They get sick themselves. This is such important research. How do people design the airflow in an operating room to keep you safe when you're getting open heart surgery? Mullen worked on a study looking at different ventilation systems to see which were the cleanest. If you want to understand the type of research scientists do on ventilation, this is a great example. Let's take a look at it. So we studied the bacterial concentration in air. So we pull in a lot of air. You can think of like a vacuum cleaner mm -hmm. uh, with a filter on. So we pull in a lot of air and then we have a filter there where the bacteria get stuck. And then we put this filter on one of these Petri dishes. Mm -hmm. And then we can cultivate and count the number of bacteria that was in that air sample. This is so simple. By collecting bacteria from the air from different places around the room, they were able to figure out which was the cleanest ventilation. And it turns out the cleanest option was where the output of the air was right above the operating table. This seems pretty intuitive, but now we have science to back that intuition. And I think it's worth mentioning that they care about cleanliness, but also about temperature and environmental control. Because they are wearing a lot of like an apron and then a lead vest and then another apron and a lot of masks and double gloves. So it's quite sweaty for the surgeon, while the nurse standing to the side, she's just wearing short sleeves and a pair of gloves. So mm. it's very different. Yeah. yeah, it was well well ventilated where the surgeon is and a bit less high air flows in, yeah. in the surrounding. I just want to say, Airflow is chaotic. Mullen told me there's still a lot we don't know. Like for example, how far infectious diseases can travel in little droplets in various spaces. So that six feet or two meter social distancing rule, that's not completely understood and it's not exact in all spaces and situations. Airflow gets really complicated real fast. Which brings me to the entire field of study that we're talking about here bioaerosols. Bioaerosols are tiny particles in the air that are living or dead, but we're living. For example, you can create bioaerosols by coughing or sneezing out the viruses and bacteria in your body. And then scientists in Mullen's field study those coughs and sneezes. In fact, Mullen is looking to create the perfect sneeze. I'll explain. When you cough or sneeze, you eject this hot, moist, turbulent cloud of air that can travel up to eight meters in a room. The cloud, which is warmer than the surrounding air, is buoyant, so it moves upward. And it's also comprised of droplets of various sizes, so larger droplets fall to the ground faster, which means they're less of a risk for transmission of diseases, but then smaller droplets can hang around longer in the air. Interestingly, if you sneezed on the moon, all of the droplets would immediately fall to the ground no matter the size, although you wouldn't be able to breathe after you sneeze, so that's a problem. So to study these phenomena, here on Earth. Mullen has worked on designing a spray bottle that accurately simulates the bubbles that humans produce when they cough or sneeze. The perfect sneeze, my words, not hers. One study found that bubbles, like the ones you produce with your snot, last longer if they contain bacteria. Researchers found that bacteria secrete a substance that stabilizes the bubble membrane, a lot like soap does. And then because the bubble lasts longer, the membrane gets thinner, and then when it bursts, it creates a lot more tiny droplets that can transmit disease. This is a hugely important find for disease transmission. It means that by the very chemistry and dynamics of bacteria, they can last longer in the air. And the same might be true for viruses. That's crazy. Here's a fun fact sort of, about coughing. A cough can travel as fast as 50 miles an hour and expel almost 3,000 droplets. Now you know. So how do you combat the transmission of disease in the air? Well, one massively important method is to simply replace the air. Ventilate. There's even a unit of speed for replacing the air. It's cubic feet per minute. As it turns out, different types of spaces have different recommended ventilation standards. For example, the ventilation system in your house is supposed to replace the air about every three hours. Did you know there are standards for ventilation systems of bank vaults? Because you know, if you get stuck in a bank vault, well, you'll have a lot of other problems, but at least you'll be able to breathe. In fact, you're supposed to get the same rate of new air as you would if you were stuck at the office, about five cubic feet per minute of new air per person. That's why they always break in through the ventilation systems. In weight rooms, air needs to be exchanged four times faster than the bank vault because when you work out, you produce more carbon dioxide. So all those fans at the gym, I thought that was just for cooling people down, but it turns out it's to move air around the room as well. The real lesson here though, is that the next time you're stuck in a bank vault, don't do a high intensity workout because there might not be enough airflow. Now, bigger spaces have more space for airflow and exchange. So what's the biggest space? So in outdoor, you have a huge um, surrounding volume of air. Mm -hmm. You may also have quite like some air turbulence and some airflow and some wind maybe going past. Mm -hmm. And that will dilute the 
aerosol concentration very efficiently mm -hmm. and very fast. Knowing that space size affects ventilation, we can revisit our original question, whether disease transmission is particularly worsened on an airplane. You're in an enclosed space. You're packed like sardines. Think back to that 1977 study where 72% of passengers were infected. Well, the ventilation system was off. When it's running, studies found that outbreaks on flights for a recent type of flu, the H1N1, spread to just one to 5% of passengers. But it turns out airplanes have very active ventilation systems. Within two to three minutes, they've entirely replaced the air in the cabin with fresh, albeit dry air. Airplane systems are continually pumping out the air that you coughed into, your neighbor sneezed into, your other neighbor's drool evaporated into, and they're replacing it with new filtered outside air. That's why it's so important to keep the air flowing. Although, to complicate things, it matters where you take your air in from. For example, if the air intake for your ventilation is on the ground, you might suck up more particles, more dust and bacteria. So that's another active area of study for bioaerosols. And the final lesson is that good ventilation cannot make a space completely safe. Malin pointed me to a paper that showed people in aisle seats had a higher risk of infection than anyone else because people walking back from the bathroom like to touch the backs of seats. That's why disinfecting surfaces and not touching your face is so important. Don't touch your face unless you want a case of the flu. There are a few more factors in the transmission of COVID-19 I was curious about and thought you all might want to know. Here's one. How long does SARS-CoV-2 stick around on various surfaces? A study published in March found that the virus stays intact on plastic the longest and copper the shortest. The study found that there were still detectable virus particles after three days on plastic and stainless steel. For cardboard, no viable virus is found after 24 hours. And for copper, no virus has existed after just four hours. So copper has antiviral properties. And the last piece of this whole puzzle that was really interesting to me had to do with how many virus particles you need to get infected. For example, if you were exposed to HIV, you wouldn't get infected with just one virus particle. You would need a certain number of virus particles, and that number is the so-called infective dose, which is defined as the lowest number of virus particles that will cause an infection to 50% of people in a group if you give them that number of particles. So for example, for certain strains of HIV, that infective dose is about a thousand particles. So what's the infective dose for SARS CoV-2? Well, scientists still lack enough data to say, but based on their understanding of SARS, which is a similar coronavirus, one expert says the infective dose should be on the order of a few hundred or thousand coronavirus particles to develop symptoms. So we started this video with air ventilation to learn how diseases spread, but it turns out that's the tip of the iceberg. I hope you learned something new though, because I know I did. Thank you so much for watching. Happy physicsing, stay safe, and be careful riding mountain bikes. Hey, hey, hi, you're still here, which means I get to tell you all about this big announcement that I have. I'm gonna be a physics teacher, at least right here on YouTube. I'm making a course. It's like a physics 101 course. It's based off the AP Physics 1 curriculum. So if you're taking the AP Physics 1 class and you're gonna take the test, it's a great review. And it's also gonna just be a lot of fun. It's me deep diving into all the phenomena that got me so hooked on this subject. All the lessons are gonna be freely available right here on my channel. So keep an eye out. The first lesson in the trailer is gonna drop within the next couple weeks. And then the rest of the lessons will be released throughout 2020. So I'm very excited to help y'all learn from home. So stay tuned. Physics 101 with Diana coming soon.